Okay, hello and welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Network webinar series. Um, today we are joined by Robert Haffey, um, who will be speaking on the topic of uh, the safe path to a lean success journey. Um, so thank you, Robert, for, for joining us today. Just before we go into the webinar, um, just a few things about who we are at the Enterprise Excellence Network. Um, so we are a network for senior lean leaders based in Europe um, and founded by Professor Peter Hines. Um, our workshops um, are commonly held as live workshops um, before COVID where we would visit um, benchmarking host sites. Um, at the moment, we're doing everything virtually and we, we hope to get back to normal next year. Um, but if you would like to find out a bit more about me, you will uh, about the network. Sorry, you will find my email address um, at the end um, uh, as an email. Um, so I'll hand over to Peter now just to say a few more words about Robert. Thank you, Peter. Great, thank you very much, uh, Emma. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. And uh, welcome to our um, our uh, webinar today. Uh, very pleased to have uh, Bob Haffey join us. And uh, and and Bob. Um, has written a, a number of books. I, I have two, and both of those are on uh, lean safety, which is really going to be the topic uh, today. I'm sad today I haven't got his new book, which is more about uh, driving around the world, trying out cultures and beer. Um, so he's even got a can of beer he might show you in a in a minute from that. Um, but really, what what Bob is an expert in is is not only about looking at teaching safety uh, you know within a lean context but actually turning it the other way around and teaching lean from a sort of safety point of view and, and, and safety connotations and so forth so i think we're in for a, a good session today so uh, bob will take us away for uh, half an hour just over half an hour and then we'll have plenty of time for uh, q a so during uh, the presentation or at the end of the presentation Feel free to fill in questions in the in the question box, and I'll uh, I'll share those with uh, with Bob at the end. Okay, so uh, Bob, take us away. All right, thanks, Peter, and thanks, Emma. Hello, everyone. Uh, first thing I want to do is fess up. Uh, I am not a safety professional. I have no safety certifications, uh, nor have I ever worked as a safety professional. So I'm a lean guy. Um, so this first slide. Let me get to the first slide. Shows the western shore of Ireland, which is the Cliffs of Moher. When I revisited there about six, seven years ago, things had changed considerably since the prior time. Uh, instead of walking a dirt path towards the cliffs, there were now concrete walkways. And when you got to the cliffs, you faced these vertical stones and you had to go left or right on the walkway, which took you to viewing platforms. And so you could get up on the platform and safely look over the cliffs of Moher. But at the end of both walkways were huge signs that said, do not go beyond this point. And yet, if you look off on the cliffs farther down, you'll see there's people walking along the edges of the cliffs of Moher, which is dangerous based on the sign you see in the slide because cliffs erode from the bottom and people often fell to their death. So. When I do my normal two-day workshops, I always start with this slide and I ask people, why are people doing that? Why are they going by the safety signs? And I get the usual answers. Uh, they don't think it'll happen to them. They want to get a better view, et cetera, et cetera. And I always end up talking about culture because the tourists that get off a tourist bus might stop at the viewing platforms. But the Irish who've walked along the Cliffs of Moher forever are gonna, they're gonna go right past the signs and they're gonna walk along the cliffs because that's the culture at the Cliffs of Moher. So culture is how people think, act, and interact. And if you're starting the lean journey, what you're trying to do is change how people think, act, and interact. And so lean is really easy to understand, but it's very difficult to do because you're trying to redirect a culture. So how do you view safety? If you look at this slide and you look at the picture on my left, the early prototype of a hydraulic bucket lift made out of a ladder and some two by fours, or the three men with the job description of counterweight who are standing on a plank 
so their mate can grind on the side of a ship. Uh, those are obvious safety problems you would identify during a compliance safety walk. But if you look at the picture in the top right, uh, managers and plants all over the world would walk right by this gentleman and not think anything. But this was at a workshop in Birmingham, England in a small GKN plant, and I had workshop attendees behind me, and I said, what do you see there? And they said, well, his back and neck are out of neutral. And I said, well, what are the opportunities for improvement? And they said, well, we could get a sit-stand stool to lower his torso, or we could raise the height gauge because he was gauging parts from us. He was running a CNC lathe, and every eight minutes he would take a part, take it to the height gauge, and gauge it. So they were observing the person work and looking at how they could make work safer and easier, and that's really what we're gonna talk about today. That's what lean safety is, and that's what it's all about. Because if you have an eight minute cycle time in that part, this individual is bending over to gauge parts about 13,000 times a year. And then you might, as a lean thinker, ask yourself, well, why is he gauging every part? But we won't go there today. So lean thinkers always talk about the current state and the future state. So what's the current state of safety? I do workshops all over the world, and the current state all over the world is that they are, they are designed around compliance to rules. Whatever country you're in, there's some regulatory agencies, and your safety program is based on compliance to those rules. So what's missing in the current state is uh, continuous improvement, uh, employee engagement in the safety program, uh, the employees are out there doing what you've asked them to do, which is be productive and stay safe and not get hurt. And then direct leadership involvement is missing because leaders hire safety professionals and ask them, keep us compliant, make sure our people aren't hurt, and leaders go off and do other things. So I can tell you there's a police car in this slide for a reason because safety professionals feel like they're policing the workforce and the workers feel like they are being policed. And if you're on the lean journey, lean is really a trust building journey, a trust earning journey. And so when you're policing people, that really does not help your lean journey and moving it forward. So what's the future state? Well, for me, it's, it's a, a new safety culture built on trust and employee engagement. So the lady in the middle of this picture, her name is Debbie, and uh, how would you like to have a plant full of Debbies uh, doing the work in your plant? Because she's pretty happy and overjoyed because she just finished a three-day Kaizen Blitz event, and she was the one we focused on. And uh, I'll talk more about it later, but that's really the focus. It's to get your people engaged in your safety efforts so they feel it's theirs. It's not management, it's not the safety manager safety program, it's their program. So we should always put a definition to things, and I wrote a book called Lean Safety, so there should be a definition of what it is. But whenever I do workshops, the first thing I ask uh, the attendees is, what's the def definition of lean that you use in your facility that you were trained to understand and that you as a manager are using to train your reports? And they all look at me kind of funny and they don't really have a definition. They'll give me some words like waste, elimination, and once in a great while they'll say customer, but, but they really don't have a definition. So one thing I'd like you to do is think about your plant and what's the definition you use and does everybody know what it is? So lean safety. First of all, lean is a philosophy, it is not a program. It, lean is a way of thinking. So lean safety is taking a lot of the same lean tools that you use if you're on the lean journey and that same management philosophy that we can improve anything over and over and over again. And we're gonna intentionally create a continuous improvement safety culture that engages the work for us and moves lean forward. So that's, that's the objective of lean safety. So one company I've worked with is Turner Construction. They're the largest construction management company in the US. And I had about 50 managers in a room. 
And if you go to Turner's website and click on the safety tab, they have an acronym that they use on all their construction sites and it's LIFE, L-I-F-E. And it stands for living injury free every day. And that's a really great goal and they really stress that. But I told the 50 managers I had in the room that that wasn't good enough for me because mine is L-P-F-E, living painkiller free every day. Because a lot of people take two Advil before or after work or after work in the US they'll drink six light beers or they'll have one good craft beer like this to ease the pain from working. So the goal of lean safety is to focus on the employee, their work tasks, make those work, work tasks safer and easier for them. And if you do that, they immediately will engage because what you're doing is about them. So a blinding flash of the obvious for me some years ago is that lean and safety are inextricably linked, which means they're impossible to disengage. Um, so if you walk up to someone doing work and you say, hey, I see you're bent over a lot, your back ever bother you? And they go, my back hurts every day. And then you engage with them and talk about the work processes and how you might change and enhance them so they don't have to bend anymore. Uh, they automatically engage and pretty soon they're, they're grabbing you by the arm and pulling you around their work center or their department to show you other things they'd like you to look at with them and improve. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Two slides ago, I mentioned Debbie. You know, Debbie worked in a plant where they made springs and she packed springs. And, and we just walked around and observed her work like he would do during a traditional Kaizen Blitz event, but we had no stopwatch. Because our goal wasn't cycle time, our goal was to reduce the risk of soft tissue injuries for Debbie. And the first day she, you know, she felt like we were all staring at her and she probably went home and complained to her husband and children. Uh, but by day three, she was smiling ear to ear because she had just taken the whole management team from Rockford Spring out to her work center and she demonstrated her one piece flow cell. So we did all the lean stuff and we set up a lean one piece flow cell, but we did that by focusing on her safety. So it's just amazing how if you use safety as the entry point, um, you can really engage people and move lean forward. So that was the blinding flash of the obvious for me some years ago. And then I wrote the book and now I've been consulting for 11 years and my passion for the topic is the same. So in any change process, uh, managers must change first. I think that's obvious to everybody, but they often forget it. So in my workshops, I, I focus quite a bit on managers and their role, their changing role. So the process is the problem, not the person, is the first thing I try and stress. So rather than focusing on people and their production and asking them just to do their job, and then when there are quality problems, you know, addressing that with them, you know, you become a process thinker and you start looking at the processes with your people and you start improving processes because you and soon they understand you can improve them endlessly and we should always be improving them. So there was one safety manager who he sat through my workshop and then later he contacted me and he says, hey, I, I had a safety issue here and I don't think that statement is true because a fellow had to turn a valve and he got a straight ladder instead of a step ladder. And he leaned the straight ladder against a wall to get up to turn a valve and the ladder slid and he got hurt. So it was a people problem, not a process problem. And so like all lean thinkers, I started asking why. I says, well, why did he need a ladder? And I said, well, because he had to turn a valve. I says, well, why is the valve where you need a ladder? He says, well, that's where it was put. I said, well, who put it there? Well, I don't know, whoever built the plant. And I says, well, it sounds to me like the root cause is that 
there's a you need a ladder to turn the valve so why don't you make the corrective action in your accident investigation that you're going to lower the valve where nobody ever needs a ladder to do it because you're going to reduce the cycle time of the changeover or whatever he's doing and you're going to eliminate the risk of injury so leaders need to understand they have to become process thinkers so instead of being the boss they need to become a coach that understands the process the problem and then work with their people to solve their problems so i read on the internet that telling is an act coaching is making a personal investment in someone and it's said that winston churchill said this so since it was on the internet it must be true and so I, I talk a lot about this in my workshops also. So asking versus telling. Managers are paid to tell people what to do. And so it's real difficult to stop doing that. And yet, if you're going to grow your people, and that's your job on the lean journey is to grow your people, you have to ask questions. So if a, if a machine operator comes up to a supervisor and says, my machine broke down, and the manager says, OK, I'll call the maintenance manager. And he does, and the maintenance manager then contacts the maintenance person, and they send someone out to the machine to look at it. That's that's kind of normal process in many plants. But let's say that manager goes to a lean safety workshop, and he's back at work the next week, and the operator comes up again and says, my machine's broke down. And now the manager looks him right in the eye and says, what do you think we should do about it? And the operator's going to go, well, we should call maintenance. And maybe the manager now says, well, my office is right there. Why don't you go in and grab the phone and call the maintenance department, tell him he needs some help. And he walks away. So what he did is he asked the operator to think about the customer, right? Because the shortest cycle time in every plant in the world is for the machine operator to contact a maintenance guy and have him come out and fix his machine. And all that management structure does is get in the way of that. So he asked the operator to think about customer service. That's what managers need to do. So this gentleman is bagging grass uh, and he's standing along the Seine River in the center of Paris. And in my workshop, I ask, you know, uh, lean thinkers, I you know, think, become a lean thinker and how would you improve the bagging process? And they're gonna have a wire hoop to hold the plastic bag open. Someone says, well, we'll get two people, someone to hold the bag and so we'll double the labor content. Uh, and then someone will say, well, let's get a bagging lawnmower or a mulching mower that'll just chop the grass up and leave it where it was. And then someone will have the ultimate solution. Let's get a herd of goats, have them cut the grass, and they'll fertilize the grass at the same time. But then I ask the workshop attendees to just look at the individual during the work and tell me what you see. And eventually they'll say, well, his neck and back are bent. And every time he raises that pitchfork, he, they don't see that, but I explain it, his shoulder goes out in neutral. And so he's doing that over and over. So if I walked up to him and I said, hey, what's your name? And he says, Pierre. And I said, my name is Bob. And I noticed you're bent over when you're doing this job. You do this job a lot. You see, I do it every day. He says, how does your neck and back feel? He says, well, it hurts every day. Oh, would you like to work with a team of people to see if we can improve this process? You know, he's probably going to say yes. So again, I'm reinforcing the fact that we're observing someone work, not to critique them. And one thing I want to make very clear, lean safety is not behavior-based safety. We're not trying to observe anybody's behavior or change their behaviors. We're trying to engage them to earn their trust. And so if I focus on them and make their job safer and easier, I will earn their trust and remember, Lean is a trust building journey. So you have to do that one person at a time and lean safety is a great way to do it. Lean safety gamble walks. Uh, this is a group in Australia at Olex Cable. So let me get my piece of paper here. Just so again, on a lean safety gamble walk, we are not looking for non-compliance items. We're not checking the tags and the fire extinguishers. We're not looking to see if people have the earplug safety glasses or steel-toed shoes on. Lean safety gamble walks are about observing people work 
but not from a distance. We go up and explain what we're doing. We introduce ourselves. We, we quickly try to gain some comfort with them, some relationship with them, and then ask for their permission to watch them work, right? So it's all about building trust. So I was at a plant in Iowa here in the US, and there was a young man underneath the chassis of a truck that was up on a hydraulic lift. And I could observe him, he was standing under the chassis, but his neck was bent to the side like this because he couldn't stand up straight. There wasn't enough room. And, and because I saw his neck in that position, it triggered me to go and say, hi, what's your name? My name's Bob, uh, what are you doing? So, well, there's a bundle of wires that come from the engine compartment and I have to tie them to the frame of the truck and take them to the rear. And I'm using these wire ties. I said, would you mind if I watch you for a minute? He said, no, I'll go right ahead. So he would fish the wire tie through the frame and it was black. And then he would try and see the end of the wire tie so he could grab it. And because the truck on the lift blocked the light from the ceiling, it was pretty dark underneath there. And so I said, why is the wire tie black? And he said, well, I don't know, somebody bought them and that's what they gave me. And I says, well, if you had your choice, what color would you like it to be? He thought for many, well, high-vis yellow or orange or white. I said, well, that's an opportunity for improvement. I says, you know, let's put that on the opportunity list we have out here in the workshop, and we'll see if we can get someone to talk to you about that. So simply by watching people and watching for some, some things, it can trigger you to go talk to them. So on Lean, Lean Safety Gamble Walks, this X'd out compliance sign reinforces the fact that we are not looking at compliance. We're looking at people at work. So we're looking for body parts out of neutral. We're looking for straining. We're looking for people lifting items and we're looking for repetitive work. If we see any of those things, those are the triggers to engage them in a conversation. We also look at product flow because if you have bad flow in your plant, you have a lot of material handling, that is a risk. We look at material handling are people still using their backs or do they have carts? Do they have vacuum lifts? How are they material handling? We look at storage containers. Are the containers easy for the people to get things in and out of? How do you send the products you make to your customers? Are those containers easy to work with? And then we look at layouts because if you have bad layouts, then you have all kinds of terrible material handling and there's all kinds of safety risks involved in it. Okay, there's just two slides left and this is the second to the last. Um, in this picture is, is a lady that I dealt with in a workshop and I had seven days of training that I did in this small sheet metal fabrication shop. And um, six of them were Hispanic, Mexican, and one was an Anglo white guy engineer. and the Hispanic people were very nervous. Uh, they were asked to go into training. They normally never went into training. And I had talked to two brothers ran this business that their father had started. And, and we decided on the seven days of training. So the first day I got there and we all went into a room and 5S was the first topic and we had books, workbooks. So I said, open it to page five and let's read through the five S's. And they did. And I said, okay, close the book because we're done. Let's Where's the place in your plant that nobody wants to work? And they all said the grinding room. It's dusty, dirty, noisy. Uh, okay, let's go out there. I says, we're gonna 5S this room. So the first S was so you know sort. So let's sort through everything. Let's throw everything out of here. We don't need to do the job. So anyway, for the rest of the day, we did 5S. We went home at the end of the day and the, the owner had that room painted white uh, overnight on the afternoon shift. We came in the next day, we finished the last two S's, including taking photographs of everything in its new state, put them in a book because that was gonna be their audit process using that book. And then we next did a plant layout and we used mock-ups to lay out and look at flow. Then we did a Kaizen blitz on a setup reduction on a press break. And then we did a Kaizen event on uh, assembly in their finished assembly area. Because even though they were a sheet metal job shop, they did some assembly for some of their customers. 
And so this lady, Alma, that you see in, in the slide, that's where she worked. So at the end, I had them get up in front of the two brothers and do a presentation. And you can't believe how nervous they were, but they did just wonderful. And at the end of the presentation, the one of the brothers, uh, he was just blown away by what his people had accomplished and how they had grown. He sent me an email later and he said, you not only impacted them at work, you impacted them in life. I can't believe how you changed them in the seven days you were with them. And so it was one of the most rewarding experiences I had consulting. About three years later, I found myself at another plant about three miles from this plant. I was prepping them for a workshop I was going to do the following week. And so I called this, the brother, the owner, and I said, hey, I'm in the area. Could I stop in? And he says, yeah, please do. So I, I rode over there, went in, and, and he was glad to see me. The list I had left him of things he should stop doing and things he should start doing, he still had hanging on the wall next to his computer. And finally he said, you want to go out to the Gamba? You want to go to the shop floor? I says, absolutely. We walked out the door. We were, we were out the door about 10 feet, and this lady, Alma, who was working in the same assembly area, come running over towards me. And she says, Bob, I just thought of you today. And I says, why was that? He says, well, we have a brand new job. And I was thinking, how would Bob do this? And what she meant was, how can I apply lean safety and make this safer and easier for myself? So if you look at what it says in this slide, you know, if we, you know, just forget, forget about it being lean, but it's it, a lot easier if we could just understand it's about serving others, developing people, and solving problems. because that's what managers need to do on the lean journey to be successful. And if you use safety as the entry point, people easily engage and it really helps move lean forward, start lean or reinvigorate lean. So another company I worked with was a mid-sized construction management company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the US. And uh, Mike Abels, who was a COO, sent me this in an email after I did some training and a, some lean safety gamble walks on a couple of their job sites. You know, again, it, it makes, you know, having that lean centric point of view, or again, using lean safety, making people first, it makes this lean improvement idea um, grounded in ethics, more ethical, because managers management teams all over the world have has you they've used lean as a cost savings program and so often when people who do the work hear the word lean they're run in the other direction or if they're involved they'll be involved but they aren't going to give you their hearts and minds and they won't fully engage so lean safety is a way to do that so here's one of the only two quotes i can claim as my own uh, you can continuously cope or you can continuously improve the choice is yours my contact information is on this slide. Love to hear from you. I'm gonna, we're going to do Q&A here in a minute, but feel free to contact me anytime after. I'd love to chat with you if you have questions. So I'm going to turn the slides off and turn this back over, and Peter is going to lead the Q&A. Great, great. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, really, really interesting presentation. So. Um, so the plan is now, if you have uh, questions for Bob, if you'd like to type them into the question uh, session uh, section in the uh, in the pop-up menu, it should be on your right-hand side. Then uh, then I can pose those to Bob, and we can uh, see where we go from there. Um, so wh while you're doing that, um, I've got a couple of things that I was sort of interested to get your view on on Bob. So the first one of those is um, obviously you focused on uh, lean safety, which is sort of more, um, if you like, the, the physical health side of things. What about the sort of mental health side of things? Because we hear a lot about psychological safety and things like that these days. How, how does that come into what your, your work? You know, I think it does. Be, one of my clients was the California State University system. They have 27 universities in the state of California, and they're they're their workers' compensation costs, you know, paying for people to get injured, uh, were there uh, people that did all the cleaning of classrooms, sweeping, mopping, 
So it was all of the, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, the facilities management people. And so I did seven workshops in seven different uh, campuses. They brought people from other campuses. So I got to touch the whole university yeah. system. And so I'm, I'm instructing people who are working the night shift, the afternoon shift. They're cleaning up after other people, you know, dumping the 50 trash cans in the library. And, and these people are isolated. They feel they have no voice. They've been dealing with the same problems over and over and over again. And so I think that is stressful on people going into work every day, knowing I get the same issues. I have no outlet hmm. to speak up, be heard, and get things changed. And so I was just amazed at how these people reacted to this workshop. You know, the example I used of 50, there were literally 50 small trash cans in a library. They each had a plastic bag in them. So they had to take a bag out, put a new bag in, and dump 50. And so instead of having, you know, three recycling centers in the library where students would be charged with having some responsibility to walk over there to put their paper or coffee cup instead of 50 trash cans. So they had no voice in that. But they could mm -hmm. if managers learned to listen and looked at process with them, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the whole idea of psychological issues is having a voice being heard mm. which is why where i worked for the last you know 23 years a company mm -hmm. called flexco we focused on culture first not lean tools we developed high performance work teams before we did anything else and we gave them ownership of their work cells because we watched those people grow and take ownership so they were mm. business owners after seven mm. years of doing that they own the little business where they produced a family of parts, delivered to finished goods. Mm. So that's my take mm. on it, Peter. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that puts me in mind of a story. I was visiting a, a Shingo Prize winning firm in Scotland uh, who were making newspapers. And uh, one of the things I was very impressed with them is I went, went down some of the main corridors and in the main corridors, they had these A3 forms, which were personal achievement uh, logs. And basically, all the employees filled out this log. So on the left-hand side, it talked about you know the the systems in the company and so forth. And in the middle, it talked about the vision, the strategy, and and also celebrating people's uh, successes outside of the workplace, like playing yeah. rugby or fishing or whatever it is. And then on the right-hand side, it had a series of columns. So it was what are your achievements in terms of making lean improvement? what is your achievements in terms of uh, training and development and what's your role in continuous improvement in the business and you might think well that's great but what I was really blown away is when I got to one and it was a contract cleaner and mm -hmm. the contract yeah. cleaner filled this form in and was talking about their role in 5S and exactly yeah. the sort of thing that you're talking about yeah. they were connected they were being treated uh, exactly the same as everyone else they were part of the community and, and clearly they were they were contributing uh, as a result. So yeah. One good. other quick little story. Where I worked at Flexco, we had developed these high performing work teams. And when we were, normally if you have an outside visitor or customer come in, you know, who, who leads them to your plant? You know, someone from sales or some manager. Hmm. We had our largest distributor visiting a plant and we would post who would like to give a tour of the plant. And someone who worked in our cold heading department, and if you're familiar with cold heading, that's making nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, who worked in cold heading, full of grease, he, he washed up his hands, and he led four or five people from our largest distributor on a tour of the plant. And these people were blown away. And they, they sent a, a, an email later about it was the best, best plant tour they've ever had in their life. They couldn't believe how much ownership that individual had, how much knowledge he had of the business, because then we sat down all of our employees every quarter and went through the financials with them. You know, so we treated them as business owners. If you want them to act like a business owner, treat them like a business owner, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Um, we we been still on the question front. Oh, I think we've got one coming in. So here we go. Let's have a look at this one. So there's one from Stephen here. Um, hi, Robert. Very nice presentation. Thank you. What is your process for engaging with managers? 
Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell a story. <laughs> uh, I had a contract with the U.S. Postal Service. And so I did seven events because the country's broken up into seven districts. And we were up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was traveling with two people from the Postal Service, my handlers. And uh, so we went in the afternoon before the event to meet the management on site to tell them what we we're going to do, let them know. And uh, I, I talked about what I was going to do. And I said, you know, I can talk about this all day because that's what I do, but I'd love to show you. I says, any of you want to go with me on a lean safety gamble walk? I'll take you out to the shop and uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate what I'm going to do with your people. So you sure. So, you know, the guy in charge, of course, he didn't because he didn't care about people. He left because he was too busy, but a couple other managers did. And I took him out there and there was a lady running a mail sorting machine and, and letters are flying through this at light speed. And I introduced myself, told her what I was doing and asked if there was anything that really bothered her. And, and pretty quickly, we came up with a couple opportunities for improvement. And because it was noisy, I went back to the manager. They were standing in back of me, the two managers, and I explained the dialogue. I had it there employee. And the one manager, he was like just blown away how this employee had interacted. He goes, wait a minute. There's a lady I need you to talk to. He went running down an aisle and I ran after him and he, and he found this lady who was like his biggest problem person in the plant. And he said, I want you to talk to this lady. And I did. And pretty soon I had her laughing and she's showing me what she did. And we identified a couple more opportunities for improvement. And, and he could not believe it. He could not believe that I could engage her and get her to open up because she was such a difficult person for him to deal with. So what I generally do with managers is I demonstrate. I can sit in a room and talk about lean safety all day, but the best training occur, best lean training always occurs when you go do it and demonstrate it. <clears throat> so at Flexco, managers had to participate in Kaizen Blitz events. They had to rub their nose in it, right? Because that's how you really understand it. So in dealing with managers for me, it's always and I think I think it might be Womack and Jones process, you no, know, no purpose, process, people. So what's the purpose? Why are you doing lean? Why do you want to do lean safety? That has to be clear to me. Because it has to be clear to them first. And if it's not clear to them, then it's my job to make it clear. And then we talk, OK, what process are we going to follow? And then lastly, how are we going to engage your people? Because lean is about trust building. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Mm. Okay, thank you. So I had another thought while you were speaking. You you were talking about um, you, you know don't blame the people, blame the process sort of type yeah. of thing. And I think that's a sort of you know a lot of people in the lean community say that. And I I sort of got to the conclusion that maybe we should go back to blaming the people. Well, slightly yeah. controversially. Yeah. And what I, what I mean by that is actually saying to the management, what haven't you done that's allowed this yeah. to happen? So in other words, it's saying you haven't done your job in supporting or the servant leadership if you're allowing these things to fail and the process is not to work. What were your thoughts on that one? You know, earlier I said lean safety is not behavior-based safety. Yeah. But what I do say is it's really management's behavior that's the problem. Right. So if you're going to look at behavior-based safety, look at the manager's behavior. So everybody in the lean community has heard of standard work now. So in my workshop, one of the exercises that I have people do is they have to create leader safety standard work for a frontline manager. Mm -hmm. And I make it very clear that managers at all level, all levels can do leader safety standard work. Yeah. So the, the CEO can take the head of the safety committee, you know, the shop floor guy who's heading the safety committee, the CEO can take whoever that is out to lunch on one day a year and have it in his calendar because that will demonstrate the leader cares about safety, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're absolutely right, Peter. I, I couldn't agree more. Management's not doing their job. You know, and it's funny that in England, <clears throat> excuse me, we got a sip of water. In England and Australia, you can't blame the employee in a safety investigation. 
legislatively, you can't. You mm. can't discipline them. Uh, but in the U.S., people are still disciplined and given time <laughs> off. And that just drives me crazy. So mm -hmm. I run into a lot of safety professionals in the U.S. that feel they need discipline in their tool pouch. You know, it's like the last resort. You know, we need to make an example of somebody. And and I, I, I butt heads with some of those people because, no, if we ask why enough, we're going to get to the root cause that it's a process problem. And it might be management that's the process problem, mm -hmm. right? They aren't providing mm -hmm. the training required or something. But, uh, yep. Yeah. Um, I, I had another thought, and you know, I, I've been doing some reading around in this topic area, which is where I was reading your your books here. And uh, one of the other things I came across, I, I don't know if you've come across um, something called Ergo VSM. Does that mean anything to you? Ergo Value Stream Mapping. Yeah. No, but I, I, you know, just the title may help. I understand it, I guess. Right, right. I just found it quite an interesting sort of concept. Yeah. So it was, it was basically a group of Scandinavian academics who'd, um, you know, come up with this idea of combining, you know, rather than safety being a separate thing, they actually yeah. put it together and they and they right. looked at um, uh, sort of musculoskeletal issues at the yeah. same time as they were looking at, you know, the the workflow and they were saying that you know, sometimes the lean stuff actually makes it worse for the employees. Um, taking out the rest periods and so forth right. is actually potentially bad for the employees and and, and, uh, and so forth. Well, a value stream map, I mean, you could use it to map, let's say, a changeover, right? Yeah. So I mentioned I've done safety Kaizen Blitz events. So I've done them on changeovers. I've done them on assembly processes. And so we're doing the same thing you would do in a Kaizen event, right? We're observing each step of the process yeah. and we're looking for opportunities for improvement in each one of those. But what's missing is a stopwatch. Yeah. So the slide with Debbie on it, again, we, we didn't use, I wouldn't allow a stopwatch. And mm. I was still working at Flexco at the time. I, as a volunteer, I led a safety Kaizen event at Rockford Spring because they're part of our safety community. And, and so, I can tell you, we really whacked the cycle time. Mm. <laughs> what, she was so much more productive and so less tired when she went home mm. uh, because of the event. So essentially it's the same thing as a value stream app you know, mm. recording each process step on a, a mm. Kaizen Blitz event mm. process step sheet, right? But, but, you know, us lean thinkers are always creating new titles and names for things so we can write books. And, yeah, and so, yeah. I mean, these, these guys, it was, it was quite yeah. interesting. I mean, they... They start out by looking at, you know, various, uh, you know, physical issues, repetitive strain injury, these yeah, sort of things. Right. And then they extended it to some of the sort of mental stresses that, that you might yeah. see in different roles. And they and they basically along the map, they could score each yeah. role in these different areas. And then that would be part of the discussion of how, what you did in the improvement. So how you did stuff to help the employee as well as to help the uh, to help the company. I, I found it sort of quite an interesting uh, thought. I have another quick little story that supports what you're saying. Uh, Australia, uh, working with an individual company, and they were, they were making concrete. So they had an area where they were bagging concrete into bags that you would sell at here at Home Depot or whatever your mm -hmm. mm -hmm. do-it-yourself place is in England. Um, and so it was a rotary machine. So there's something that would pick up the empty bag, and then it would be rotated to a station where it'd get filled and rotate another station where it gets sealed. And, mm -hmm. and so there's an operator tending this thing. And so the vacuum cup or whatever, they would pick up the one bag, would lift it up. But because when the bags were made, the glue that glued the bottom flap had bled out, it caused bags to stick together. Mm -hmm. So just as I was coming up there with all these managers, this thing is like picking up, there's bags flying everywhere. And the operator was so frustrated, so frustrated. <laughs> and so I didn't say anything. I just stood there and I let them just watch him mm. in his mm. frustration. Mm. And then, then finally, I said, so what do you see here? Because we were out looking for opportunities to improve. And I said, what do you see here? Whose fault is this? You know, so some manager will see his output for the shift and, was, and think, you know, Joe is an unproductive guy. And, and But they don't. 
they aren't out there in the gamba, right? They didn't see the problems. Mm -hmm. And the guy in mm -hmm. purchasing that buys the bags because they're cheaper at that vendor uh, doesn't know about the problem because mm -hmm. no one's reporting it. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I see that all over the world. It's it's amazing when you go talk mm -hmm. to the people who do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, building build on that thought, you know, some of the things I've been thinking about and thinking about, you know, how do we do lean and, and how should we do lean and so forth. And, um, you know, as, as you sort of said, you know, some of the companies that are earlier on on the lean journey, they tend to be more sort of at the tools and they're not perhaps focused on some of the leadership and the behaviors and, you know, all these types of things. And uh, so I have a sort of view that maybe in the early stages of lean, some of the sort of health and safety things could get a little worse and also the mental strains could get a little worse because employees are suddenly expected to do things they're not you know like alma that you know she, she's you know rabbit in the headlights i'm i'm being expected to do things no one right. you know i'm not used to this stuff and also if we speed up we get rid of the waste we stop them having the opportunity for a little break and you know yeah. respite and so forth and then as we get better towards lean and the sort of things you're talking about, you take a more employee focused view, you get them to be part of the process of deciding what to do, then then actually right. it can get better for safety and, and health because they're actually yeah. much more likely to take that sort of stuff into account. And hence, you know, it it, it sort of mirrors the, you know, the, the, the sort of um, uh, change curve. So at the beginning, it's all scary right. and difficult. Right. But once you get on board with it and you actually see the benefits for yourself, you, you actually do stuff for yourself to make it safer. You do stuff yeah. for, the, for the company, you know, to make, you know, productivity or quality and so forth. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, you know, that you mentioned the what's in it for me, right? Mm -hmm. When people understand what's in it for me. So when, when a leadership announces we're starting the lean journey here, Everybody, everybody in the business, the, the vice presidents, everybody all the way down to the guy, the janitor, they're all going, what's in it for me? Why do I want to do this? Mm. Why do I want mm. to do this? Mm. And so it, it is, they have to see value for themselves. So in your point about safety may be impacted initially because everybody's walking around with deer in the headlights and I got these new responsibilities and I'm going faster and I don't have time to rest. Mm. Mm. Yes that could have an impact on your incident and injury rates, which again is mm. compliance safety. Mm. Mm. And and compliance safety isn't going away. So even though I talked about lean safety and a new safety culture, you're always still gonna have to do the compliance stuff. You know, it's mm. regulatory, you have to do mm. it. Mm. But, but you can do it with people that are now engaged mm. in safety. They're on a safety committee, uh, you know, at Flexco, we had no manager with safety in their title. And that was for a reason. We wanted our safety team to believe they own safety, and they did. Mm. You know, they had an agenda, and they went mm. through it every week, and they had mm. they had things they had to do, and they had a budget, and, and, you know, I was in the room just to facilitate. So, yeah, that what's in it for me, I always mm -hmm. say that, because I say that lean is a culture change journey. Mm. When your culture starts pulling lean, then you know you're lean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you're, yeah. when the people when the people on the shop floor say, "Hey, can we do a safety kaizen blitz in my work center?" Because yeah. I got I'm having yeah. some carpal tunnel issues and it's difficult. Could you help yeah. me? Yeah. You know, yeah. They're asking for lean help. Now yeah, you lean know you've got that. Culture. Yeah. But yeah, when yeah. people are still fighting it and sitting on the yeah. fence. You aren't lean at all. You're just still pushing. But, but, it's, but it's not surprising. If you come in, you do a workshop, they're not really involved. It gets changed around them. And, oh, they, yeah. and they get their little mini breaks taken out and they have to oh, work yeah. harder. Why would That's I want to do that? Exactly. That's why, you know, I just scheduled my first flight for consulting uh, down in Alabama uh, end of September. This is my fourth time at this plant. And... They've taken lean safety to heart. You know, they they formed a safety committee. They're now giving the safety committee ownership of things like you decide what earplugs and what safety glasses we're going to have on our plant. And then once a year, you can meet with vendors and decide to change them, but you have to use up the old inventory. Again, there's always yeah, rules, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. they're empowered, but there's always 
it's the empowerment squares. Yeah. You're empowered here, but there's the rules. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So they've really taken to heart. Their managers have to go on lean safety gamble walks. They have to do safety observations, and mm -hmm. and and, the, mm -hmm. and their injury rate is, you know, I got to get my hand up here right in the camera. <laughs> go the you know, right went way. down. You know, went yeah. down. They yeah, yeah. they're just doing culturally a great job of building it into their lean program. Yeah. I mean, that, that puts me in mind of a, a company where we did some work. It was a, a warehouse environment, distribution environment, a big, big, you know, huge warehouse with hundreds of people. And traditionally, the relationship between the workforce and the management was like us and them. You know, it was like, oh, sure. you know, yep. go and tell them what to do. And obviously, you hadn't necessarily got the highest level of education with some of the warehouse, you know, operatives and so forth. So what we decided to do with them is, is we, we basically sent the, the management away to work on some leadership development stuff with them in yeah. the classroom and, 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 and so forth. And then with the workforce, we basically decided to go down the, the process uh, failure mode and an effect analysis. So we basically, and, but we took that in a wider sense and you know, things like risks could be risks, health and safety risks and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we just let loose with this stuff and we, we got them to think of the risks and did the analysis and things that came out was quite a lot of it was bending and stretching and, and you know, things like that. Um, but we also looked risks of delays to the shipments, you know, yeah. risks of quality failures and mispicks, risks of trip hazards and all this sort of thing. But But because this was them doing the analysis, them thinking about it. They could get things on the agenda they'd always wanted to have on the agenda, yes. as well as some risks that were actually for the benefit of the organization. But had we done that through the management with us introducing strategy deployment, the last yeah. thing they would have wanted to do was to do anything to help the company because it was almost like, you know, they'd almost go out of their way not to help the company. But yeah. you, you put it in the environment where it was meaningful yeah. for them and they just right. they just lapped it up and it you know and we probably halved the safety instance and so forth just just I, I don't think we have the figures but you know it's the same sort of yeah. thinking yeah the people who do the work safety is always kind of beat into their head so they do think about it yeah, yeah. but what they what i always in my workshops i say what are, what are, what do the production people think about the most well it's production that's yeah. what they're asked to do every day yeah. be productive yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what they think about. So it's really, yeah. they have to stop and think safety at the appropriate times. Yeah. yeah. You know, to support it, there's a company in the U.S. that develops software that you can use on your smartphone to, to gather employees' improvement ideas. And so, you know, they're a startup, and, and, uh, and they contacted me, and we talked, and then a guy came to one of my workshops. But he said, it's funny, the employees, a lot of the improvement ideas they put in relate to safety uh, rather yeah. than productivity again because yeah. it's about them right yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. it's about exactly. them so yeah. we actually have a question here from reg but so i'll uh, put this one to you so reg is asking how does this link in with operational excellence well, it, it they're inextricably linked impossible to disengage because lean safety uses lean tools and lean thinking to engage the workforce and if you're on the lean journey or operational excellence journey, you have to engage your employees in it to be successful, period. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, I, I was director of manufacturing in a manufacturing plant. We developed high performance work teams. We completely relayed out our plant. I did all the lean stuff. I learned by doing. And when I started doing safety Kaizen Blitz events, and I saw how the that that reluctance to engage, that us versus them, just disappeared when it was about them. Yeah. There's no stopwatch. We just want to make your job safer and easier. Mm. Mind if we watch you? You want to be on the team? Mm. Uh, so mm. it it is operational excellence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm I think you're right. I mean, time's against us, so we need to wrap up. But I think. Uh, you know, a common thread of what you've been talking about that resonates with me is that, you know, you start with uh, the employee. I like to talk about the, you know, in Lean, we talk about the voice of the customer. But actually, if we want to get engagement and more traction, I think we should start with the voice of the employee. Um, yeah. What yeah. What's in it for them? What do they want out of this? 
How yep. can we create the work environment they want to do? And I think in what you've been talking about for the last uh, hour, Bob, you've really helped us uh, in, in that voice to the employee and, and how we can make great success out of it. So thank you very much for your uh, session. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Emma, thank you so much for all your coordination work. We couldn't have done it without you. You're the best. Okay. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> yeah. So Emma, thanks. do you, you want to just finish us off for the day? Yeah, thanks, Peter, and thanks, Bob, for a great presentation, um, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, look out for our, our upcoming web, uh, webinars on our website, theenterpriseexcellencenetwork.com, which you will get um, in the follow-up email as well um, as some feedback as well, which is always useful for us. So, yes, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye. Great. Okay, bye, everyone. Thanks again, Bob. Bye, everyone.